In this video, I'll be covering the most advanced methods and techniques in all the WCA events, many of which are responsible for the incredible records that are being broken recently. First off are 2x2 Pyraminx and Skewb. 2x2 is solved pretty simply. First, you solve some side or some layer, and then you solve the rest of it in one algorithm. Pyraminx is solved pretty similarly. In this event, you make one V, then you solve the rest in one algorithm as well. For Skewb, it's very similar. First, solve one layer. Then after solving that, you just solve the rest in one algorithm as well. Now for all these events, you have to one-look them, obviously. So memorize your entire solution during inspection. But the most advanced method is this another technique that you can use to get a lot more options with solving your first layer. It's pretty much building pseudo-layers. Just for example, here would be one layer. Now what if you did an R2? Now here you have a pseudo-layer. Let me give a quick example of what I'm talking about. In this case, let's say I want to make a white layer. And I'm not a 2x2 expert, but this white layer doesn't seem the greatest. However, I do see a block here and then a block here, which means with a one move setup, I have a pseudo layer. Now what I could do is solve the last layer like normal, like a CLL. The hard part about this method is that recognition is a bit more difficult. However, if you are able to recognize it, the solution of this case is super simple. You just do a soon here, and then R2 to finish off the solve. Now this is also a pretty big thing in Pyramix, where you build pseudo V's. Here you can notice that with one move you can solve this blue yellow block. And to continue with V you can do yellow, but these two pieces are both not in their place. But you do notice that you have this block here. This is not the block that belongs in the V. You would still have to solve the center and then insert one of these edges into the bottom to get a V. But instead of thinking that way, why not just keep the block here and pretend we have this pseudo V. If we notice that if we do one move, this kind of solves this piece. So we can just save that move towards the end. And instead do l 4 e right now with this algorithm. And then solve the final move at the end. Now we can realize how efficient this method can be. Now skewed is an event that is a lot harder to do this with. But if you're able to get good at recognition, being able to make pseudo layers opens up your options a ton for skewed. Here's an example. You have the white layer that's almost done. So instead of making the layer, how about we notice this piece right here? It's one move away from this position, which is solved. So you can kind of treat this as a pseudo layer. Now we can solve the rest of the cube into that pseudo layer state. In this case, it's very simple, just a sledgehammer. And then just undo the last move to fix the layer. And we solve the cube. Again, this is a very advanced technique that would be hard to do. But you can see how you can get some pretty nice solutions by making pseudo layers, solving into them, and doing that one last move at the end. Now on to 3x3. And the most advanced technique for this event is also pretty similar. It'll also be using pseudo techniques to make your F2 more efficient with pseudo slotting and building extended crosses. So the idea is pretty simple. Instead of inserting pairs like this all the time, you can have the bottom layer misaligned a little bit. And you can solve pairs like this. The best example for using this technique is whenever you have one corner and one edge solved. Apart, this looks like two F12 pairs that need to be solved. But together, you can notice it's one solved F12 pair. And we can just solve the second F12 pair like normal if we put these slots together. For example, the corner that has to go here is white, blue, orange, which is up here. And the edge is green and orange, which is back here. So what I could do is have this slot in the front and just solve those two pieces into here. In this case, take out this pair and insert it. You can see how it solves both f pairs at once. A simplified version of this, or a keyhole, was used a lot in Max Park's recent WR average, which helped him build extended crosses. For example, this one move cross can solve the cross with a block in it, which isn't that great when you insert it. So what you could do is insert this edge first. That way, when you solve the rest of the cross, it creates a free pair. So not just pseudo slotting, but using these Kiko techniques too helps people like Max and Timon get amazing solutions. With 3D one-handed, the most advanced method is actually going to be Ru. Currently, both of the world records are with CFOP, where you build a cross, F12, OLO, and PLO to solve the cube. But Ru is quite different. In that method, you build a left block, a right block, the corners, then you solve the rest of the cube in one go. Ru was proven to be amazing by Kion who held the former WR for this event, being the only one to ever do it with Rue. And recently we've seen so many improvements of Rue solving with one hand, and a lot of great results. Including Fami, who has 6 second average of 5s and low 7 average of 12s with Rue. So why is Rue better for one handed? Well first off, Rue is more efficient, since it uses more block building techniques. The move count's going to be slightly lower than CFOP. And since you're turning with one hand, 
and turning slower, move count is going to be obviously a lot more important. Also, Rue has no rotations. With Rue solving, you stay in the same orientation the entire solve, which saves all the unnecessary time and CFOP you do to rotate the cube. Finally, Rue turning just kind of matches one-handed turning. First block is probably the worst step, as sometimes it has some awkward moves, but with better hardware and advanced finger tricks, a lot of Rue solvers have developed really interesting finger tricks to make the first block solving really fast and finger trick friendly. For example, F moves are becoming very popular for one-handed, and even B moves sometimes for one-handed. The rest of the solve is pretty nice too. So I mean the next two blocks pretty much consist only of R wide, R and U moves, which is very easy to do with this finger and one of these fingers, making the step really fast for a lot of root solvers. Some in the corners is pretty standard, it's just like doing algs with CFOP, it's just an alg. And here's the cool part about root solving. The end of the solve consists of M and U moves, but now with good hardware and you can use table abuse like this to do M moves, it becomes a lot easier to do the last six edges properly to finish off the cube. With 3 by 3 a lot of times you end with R, U, and F moves, which are just awkward. You have to turn three different layers. But with Rue, you get to use just two layers of turning, which is a lot easier for one-handed solving. For clock, the most advanced method is no flip or the low method. So clock was always thought to be solved the exact same every single time, and that is mostly true. First off, you build a cross, then you flip it over, build the other cross, then solve the corners. And then you're done with solving the clock. Now the idea of no flip is pretty simple. You have to solve the cross and then flip it over, which is inefficient because you have to flip the clock around. And that's where no flip comes in. What you can do is during inspection, memorize the pins for this cross, which is pretty much just a series of numbers. And maybe some arithmetic, but the goal is to memorize the moves you need to do to solve the cross on this face. And then instead of solving the cross and flipping it over, you flip it over during inspection and solve the back cross first with your memorized moves. This avoids a flip, but here's when the method gets a bit more crazy. You can also do moves simultaneously. That means at the same time as solving the back cross, you can solve the front cross. So usually in clock, you only turn a dial when the pin is up because that's when it affects that area. However, when you have no flip, you're going to end up turning pins that are down because you want it to affect the back. But you'll notice that while turning this dial, these dials are all free to do moves in the front. So what we can end up doing is doing simultaneous moves. Moves in the back and in the front at the same time. Here's an example. Let's say you have this crazy scramble in clock where you have to move these three dials to 12 o'clock by moving it back negative four. So with the pins down, this is the dial you'll turn negative four. So as you move this dial to solve the back cross, you can use the left dial to get a head start on the current cross. For example, you can match this middle piece with this one to get one of the edges solved for the cross. So you can do those moves at the same time. He matched up these two pieces and solved the cross on the back at the same time. And with multiple simultaneous moves, you can solve clock pretty efficiently. So then for 4x4, the most advanced technique for this event is Ola Parity Avoidance or OPA. The reason why you get Ola Parity which is something like this, is because the cube is currently in an odd parity state, meaning there's an odd number of inner layer turns that were done to get to this state. So how do you avoid this OLO parity? First off, when you get a scrambled cube, trace if it's even or odd. And from there, you can count the number of inner moves you make to make sure that when you solve the cube, it ends up being an even number. Then you'll never get OLO parity. So tracing that moves isn't that bad, a lot of times you're doing triggers in 4x4, something like this, or like this. And during all these triggers, the state of the cube stays the same. The hard part about all parity avoidance is the first step, which is tracing the cube to see if it's in an even or odd state. The old method of doing this was pretty hard. Pretty much, you would have to do blind tracing on all of the wings to see if it's in an even or odd state. For example, this is how I would do it. This piece goes here, that's one. This goes here, that's two. This goes here, that's three. And we have to do that to every single wing of the cube, which is 24 pieces. Now here's the more modern approach to this. Here's another cube for reference. Usually I just put this piece right here because that's where it will be solved. However, the more modern approach is matching this piece with its partner, like this piece where it's also blue and red. As you can see, that's not where the piece belongs in the reference cube. However, if I switch this piece here, this edge looks oriented, so it should be pretty good. 
So instead of summing pieces to their soft positions, which makes me have to trace it 24 times, I can trace pieces into their partner positions, which cuts down the pieces I need to trace in half. This makes tracing a lot easier, and people can trace in around 8 seconds of this method, with plenty of time to spare for actual inspection. And now this method's getting a lot of popularity. People like Ari are getting amazing averages with it, and it's catching on with a lot of cubers actually. Even Sebastian, a former 4x4WR holder, I believe recently has used this method in competition, which just shows how much traction this method is gaining. Now for big cubes, the most advanced method is Yao. And I've been really surprised about the growth of this method. I started cubing when Yao was just starting to gain a bit of popularity in 4x4 especially. And it was a general consensus that it was good for 4x4, maybe good for 5x5, but definitely not good for 6 and 7. However, that's being flipped on its head completely these days. There's so many great Yao solvers that are dominating big cube rankings. Yes, it's true Max Park still uses Free Slice. However, other than him, pretty much everyone in the top rankings for big cubes uses Yao. For 5x5, T-Mon is the second best solver in the world. He uses Yao, pretty much everyone in the big cube rankings. Same for 6x6, Max Park's on top, but as you can see, there's a lot of familiar names on top that all use Yao. And no surprise, in 7x7, almost everyone uses Yao on top. So why is Yao being so popular in bigger cubes now? The main thing I think is efficiency. So after you make two centers, instead of building the next center, you can go on to build the edges on the left side. And since you have the whole middle layer to work with, these edges have become a lot more efficient. In addition, since you're solving the white, edges, you actually solve the cross ahead of time, which makes transition into F12 a lot easier. With big cube Yao, there are some differences for later in the solve though. Usually in 4x4 you do 3 to 3 you slice over and then you start pairing edges like that. But with 5x5 and bigger cubes, there's a lot more edges, so it's harder to do that. It's still possible, however most people don't. So generally there's two approaches for doing these edges for big cube Yao. Some people like to create two edges and then put them into their pairs like this so you have this giant block and for the rest of the edges it's all in the top and front which makes it pretty easy to look ahead and you can solve this with free slice and three cycles but the more common approach that the top solvers use is just to free slice for the rest of the solve so pretty much don't worry too much about the middle layer centers and just build pieces kind of like regular non yao free slice solves so yeah it kind of surprised me how big this method is in the rankings since i was always told that yao isn't the best for bigger cubes but considering how good it is recently with the top rankings, I would strongly consider starting to use Yao a bit more and seeing how good it could be for you. Next, for 3, 4, 5, and multi-blind, I'll be grouping these ones together because they're all solved pretty similarly. With blindfold solving, traditionally you want to solve one piece at a time. For example, if you notice this goes here, this goes here, this goes here, you would solve this piece first, and then this piece on the left. With advanced 3 blind solving, you can do 3 cycles solving 2 pieces at a time. Like this. Along with 3 style, there's a lot of advanced techniques for 3 blind solving, like twisting corners better, or solving parity cases better, but a very useful one would be floating. In blind solving, you have a buffer, which is your starting piece, which in my case is this piece. So pretty much I find out what is the next piece to solve from this piece. However, if my buffer is solved, it becomes a bit more awkward. I would have to unsolve my piece to get to another random piece, and then solve the edges from there because the only algorithms I know are those that solve edges containing this buffer piece. That's where floating buffers come in, which allows you to have many buffers that you can start from. So not just this piece. In case this piece is solved and you don't want to use it, you can use other pieces. In this case, one of these buffers might be useful. So instead of swapping these two, then these two, then these two, then these two again, you would just cycle these three pieces, solve the case. 3 blind already has a lot of algs for just one buffer, so if you want to learn them for every single buffer, it's going to be a ton of algs. However, pros don't need to learn all of them. And there's a lot of techniques they can use that reduces the alg count by quite a bit and makes them a lot easier to learn. Then for FMC. For FMC, you have a whole hour to try to solve the Rubik's Cube in the fewest moves possible. So you have a lot of time to use a lot of techniques or different tools that help you solve the cube in the fewest moves possible, including insertions and switching between the inverse and normal scrambles. But the base method for FMC is actually the same method that computers use to solve the Rubik's Cube, and that's going to be DR. And the goal of DR is to reduce to some state where you pretty much have opposite colors on top and bottom layers like this, and you can just solve the cube with some U and D moves, as well as double moves on the sides. Which, if it looks familiar, it's pretty similar to square one. And the reason it's called this method is because a domino cube is pretty much just that, a 2x2x3, two by two by where you can only do double moves on the sides. So for FMC, there's generally a few steps to do this. First off is to orient the edges correctly, in a way that everything will be solved with R, L, U, and D moves. 
And you can do this by determining bad edges. In this case, it's these two. And using the fewest moves possible to solve those bad edges. Then from here, you want to reduce it to a domino state, which means you want the E layer edges in the E layer. So those that don't have yellow and white and have the top and bottom layers only be white. And the similar idea is done here. You want to find the bad edges and corners and put them in the right spots to create DR. For example, these are all good corner and edges. There's some good ones on the bottom here too, but there's a lot of bad ones as you can see. These ones have yellow to the sides, so that's not good. This edge should be in the middle layer, so that should not be there. So after identifying all of those, you find a few number of moves to orient all of those into DR, which should end up with something like this. From here, there's a lot of ways to finish off the solve. A common first step is just to finish off the corners, and now all that's left is a bunch of edges. And our idea is since everything's opposite, you end up with more block cases, and you can try to match up these blocks, and then usually you end up with some case where you also have a few edges left at the end, where you can use a variety of techniques to solve these edges. Another interesting technique is to reduce to something like this which is HTR, where there's opposite colors on every side. And since every color has opposites, obviously making blocks seems pretty easy here. And there's a lot of cool techniques you can use that can solve the rest of the edges for you. Then for Megaminx, this is an event where there isn't too many advanced methods for, but I think a method that can be explored more is color neutrality. This is pretty uncommon with people at a high level of Megaminx. Usually they just solve one star color, which is white, and usually they have a certain order for solving the rest of the F12s. They would follow certain colors around a cube and usually end up with always the gray layer. Since Megaminx has a lot of pieces, this method works great because it's a lot easier to find pieces. However, I think being color neutral has its benefits in Megaminx. And if you don't have a certain order, you can be opened up to more possibilities. Since the Megaminx has 12 sides, the chance of the white side being the best option is, I guess, 1 in 12, which is quite a low number. But if you at least check a few other colors that look pretty good, there's a very high chance that you'll get a better solution. For example, white here has no lines, but a quick glance around, I already see a lot of colors with lines. This has a line, this has a line. This one actually has two edges in. So inspection is a bit harder, yes, but you get a lot more possibility with what you can start with. After F12, I think it's also beneficial to be able to solve whatever you want. Most cubers have some sort of order, but that might make them miss certain cases that are actually a lot better, which is why color neutrality is great for other events, and I think it should be used more in Megaminx as well. Finally, for square one, there's a few methods for solving this thing. There's Vandenberg with CSP, OBL, PBL, then Lin with CS, first block, second block, and then PLO plus one. But the feature of this event, I think, is in two look solves, or one pause solves. Right now, with the methods we do have, I think there are too many pauses in the solve. For Vandenberg, you have to pause once for OBL, then you have to pause once for PBL. For Lin, even though you can predict first block in inspection, you still have to solve the second block with a pause, and then solve PLL plus one with another pause. But the feature of square one is where you pause at most one time during a solve. For OBL, PBL, the way you can do one pause is during inspection for CSP, also predict the OBL. That way, you can get to PBL with just one look. This isn't always realistic, so what you can do is partial prediction, maybe predict the left half of the cube, which is pretty easy in this case, and look at the last slice, or maybe just predict the bottom side. That way you don't have to look at it, and you can do OBL just by looking at the top layer. Another way to do one pause solves is Vandenberg with CO and EO. So you can do partial prediction or full CO prediction first. So you do CS plus CO in one go. There's a few ways to continue from here. You can predict EO as well partially, or you could look ahead PBL during EO to get a pauseless EO PBL, or combine the both. Just by knowing how EOs affect the PBL, it's actually quite easy to one look EO and PBL in one go. For Lin, I'm not sure how you would go about this. Predicting first block during inspection is definitely needed. Maybe you could try to track the second block pieces as well during first block. But I think there has to be a way to reduce that pause in the middle, since a large part of the square one time is just pausing for those pieces. But there you go, those are the most advanced methods and techniques for every WCA event. But hopefully you enjoyed this video, and thank you for watching.